fossil fuels. And maybe we have, you know, 500 years of coal left. Maybe we have 50 or 100 years of petroleum. Who knows? They keep finding more, but it, it, I don't think it can go on forever. Okay, yeah, we need replacements, but you can't legislate these replacements into existence. It's not like the Manhattan Project where you knew the science and the rest of it was engineering. All you had to do was just go out and build the thing right so that it worked. In this case, we don't have the technology yet to know how to replace fossil fuels. Okay, and who's going to come up with, that, with those advances? Who's, who has the money to do the R&D? It's the countries that build wealth. Free markets, freedom, abundant, affordable energy. These are the things that provide us wealth so we can divert extra wealth into things like cleaning up the environment and finding alternatives for fossil fuels. I don't know why it's never mentioned that we spend over a billion dollars a year just through the federal government on alternative energy research of all kinds, and you can bet the private sector is spending way more than that because whoever comes up with a replacement is going to make a whole lot of money because everyone needs energy. That's my book. <laughs> and I had a global temperature update. You might hear sometimes, this is just sort of a postlude to my talk. This is what John Christie and I have been doing for the last, uh, gee, it's been close to 20 years. Making me feel old. I've always had a break here. Okay, but now I'm old. Um, 30 years uh, of global temperature measurements that we do from Earth orbiting satellites. They measure a deep layer of the atmosphere. You can see there's huge changes from year to year. Now, the reason why I'm showing this, you might have heard people saying, and it's real confusing if you hear this through the, through the media, oh, it's cooled since 1998. You know, it hasn't warmed for 15 years, blah, 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 blah. Well, you've heard of lies, damn lies, and statistics. Well, this is one of those cases. Yes, it has cooled since 1998 because 1998 was a huge El Nino event. Now, I could say it's warmed a lot since 1999, and that would be true, too. So, you know, to me, that stuff is irre irrelevant. What I say is temperature really hasn't changed in the last seven years. This last year, we've had strong cooling. You see right there, that's mainly El Ni or La Nina occurring out in the Pacific. And we're starting to rebound from La Nina now. There's last month, September's temperature. Now, what's interesting, this is a 30-year period during which the PDO was in its positive phase. And it does have this long-term upward trend. There are scientists that study the PDO that think we have now sh uh, uh, flipped back into the negative phase and are predicting cooling for the next 30 years. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Because if it doesn't start warming up in the next few years, the public is going to get real disinterested in this whole global warming thing. You know? So it, I'm not making any predictions because it, you know, I... You know, if, if you got a 50-50 chance of being right, I'll, I'm wrong every time because that's what happens when I'm in the line at the grocery store and at the bank. So I'm not going to make a prediction. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And hopefully you'll be hearing more and more about the possibility that maybe Mother Nature causes global climate change. And that's, that's the end of my talk. And I guess we'll entertain questions. Love to have you ask a lot of questions. Uh, I have two unrelated uh, questions. First of all, you say that um, what actually might be causing the um, uh, global warming is changes in cloud cover. But then that just pushes the question one step further back as to what's causing those changes in cloud cover. Well, <clears throat> the way that we would explain it is it's chaos in the system. The, the climate system is a nonlinear dynamical system with a huge heat capacity because of the oceans. It has the potential to change temperatures for a long period of time with a small change in circulation. It's just chaos in the system. These nonlinear dynamical systems go through fluctuations all on their own. Feedback, on the other hand, which is what they think is going on, is just temperature causing cloud change. What I'm saying is, whatever the other reasons are, they're not surface temperature. Therefore, they are not feedback. Therefore, they are forcing. It's sort of a matter of definition, but it makes a big difference. But I, I see where you're going, and you know, it's, it's a good way to be thinking. And, and as a second question, this is just from observation flying in and out of Tallahassee. Sometimes we have forest fires around the area. Other times there are prescribed burns. But it's pretty impressive to see all this smoke coming up from all these fires from the wooded areas, 
And do, can you give us an indication of how much CO2 that puts into the atmosphere compared to, say, your average daily driving around the city? Uh, I, from what I understand, uh, a forest fire out west, you know, some of these big fires do actually produce a lot. I don't know whether it's enough to actually make a difference at the at Mauna Loa, Hawaii, which is our best measurements, you know, because it, it mixes up through the atmosphere and gets diluted, you know, the extra CO2. Uh, I think it's a significant source of CO2, but it's still very small. It, it's not, it's it's not trivial, but it's it's. <clears throat> not very significant either. Uh, of course, the smoke pollution is a different thing, and that washes out like all particulate pollution will wash out within a few days. Although I met a scientist recently who works on forest fire pollution, and they actually have measurements in the stratosphere of these aerosols from the, from the uh, forest fires actually going all the way up into the stratosphere, which I find amazing, but uh, that's what they say. So uh, it's a minor effect, um, is my understanding, but it's it's not zero. Pat, how do they gather all the temperature information for the 2,000 years and so forth? And, and are you confident that those figures they have for the global temperature are accurate? Oh, I'm not confident at all in the in the temperature reconstructions. I, I I don't trust any of these paleo kinds of sciences because you don't know whether you're right or wrong. You can make up all kinds of theories in your head, and everybody in the climate community can agree, and then somebody can come along 50 years later and come up with a new theory, and then he's the outcast until everyone agrees with him 10 years later, and they all just go on their merry way. And it may have nothing to do with what actually happened over the last 2,000 years. I don't trust it, but what I do is I say, listen, if you just take the 2,000 years of temperature stuff at face value, you know, if it really is related to temperature changes in the last 2,000 years, clearly <coughs> there's big temperature changes. And as I mentioned, historically we know there were some big changes, medieval warm period, little ice age, and the proxies support it. Now the proxies themselves are like deep sea sediments and how fast uh, the layers on stalagmites and caves. It's, it's amazing that these, they're from all different locations around the world. There's like 15 locations, 18 temperature proxies, and they all have show very similar kind of retrieved temperatures or, or, or you know, proxy temperature reconstructions, which I find amazing. I, I still don't really believe it, but they believe it. The people that work on it, you know, that's their life, so they believe it. I'll go along with it for the time being. Yes, in the back. Uh, before, before I ask a question, I just want to make sure I, I have something that you're saying is correct. Sure. So do you say that oftentimes uh, a greater amount of CO2 in the atmosphere can be beneficial to the Earth? Like, into I think that's a question that needs to be objectively asked. Because if you, you, know, you talk to the scientists that work in my field over a beer at night, and they say, oh, we should, I mean, they sound like environmentalists. that. It, you know, not that environmentalism is bad, I'm not saying that, okay? Uh, but it's more in terms of how their feelings, you know. We shouldn't be putting CO2 in the atmosphere. Well, you know, maybe we should. Maybe it's one, one of the things that humanity can actually do for nature that's good. Why don't we look into the possibilities, see how many winners and losers there are, rather than that, just blindly assuming that everything we do is bad. So, you know, just, to, just to follow that up, though, is there anything in your research that would suggest there would be a, a tipping point for how much <coughs> would be too much? No, tipping points have to do with those feedbacks getting close to positive. If the total feedbacks end up becoming positive enough, that's where you reach tipping points. Jim Hansen thinks that there are tipping points, and he thinks we're close to them, okay? He's out there on the other extreme. Uh, and you know he believes in this paleo stuff in the well in the Vostok ice core record and some stuff that supposedly goes back millions of years. He relies on that and he thinks he sees a sensitive climate system. I think maybe he has the same problem on mixing up cause and effect myself. But how can you fight something like that where he says, "Hey, I'm a scientist. I've been working on this longer than anybody. I see evidence of a sensitive climate system, and I say there are tipping points coming. And if we don't turn things around really soon, we're all screwed." I mean, how do you fight that? It's a, you know, it's, it's a forecast. You can't prove them wrong. We're going to have to make decisions based on incomplete information, that's for sure. Any other questions? Up here. Is there any other research, any significant money at all being thrown at 
your side of the old web warming argument? It seems like everything else is trending. None forward. that I'm aware of. Now, we've had to piggyback our research on more generally related projects we have that we can include this as sort of tag along, you know, it sort of fits into what the goals of that project were anyway, using the data that we produce and whatever. Uh, but 